Hello everybody. This is Ken Epp with Epic Dyes on my YouTube channel. Thanks for joining me. Today I'm going to do my version of a fan fold. I know it's been done plenty of times before, but this is how I do it. So I start out with a shirt that is soaked, just sprayed. I just, I wash them, I dry them, I keep them in a bag. I spray them so they're a little bit damp and I'll spray throughout the process. I don't need them real soaking wet to do what I do. All right, so I start out by putting a screw in my board. This is just a piece of plywood with some melamine that I glued onto it from Home Depot. And then I take a string and I have predetermined arcs, uh, distances of the string loops that I put in here. And I reuse this all the time. And I'll go ahead and make some arcs. So we'll do one there. And I got another loop here. Standard stuff. Just I use these uh, Crayola washable fabric markers. It makes my hands dirty, but it comes out of the fabric. That's what's important. I hope everybody doesn't mind. I got some Grateful Dead playing in the background. Kind of gets me in the artistic mood. All right, and what I do, I don't use a protractor for this. I mark and then I measure. And I like, like, say, an inch and a half or so on my small one here. It makes for a nice, simple fan fold. And you're able to get the lines all the way to the center to come out nice and crisp. If you go too small, they end up getting blurry in the middle here. So I just go ahead and mark these off. And this fold is going to have a little twist to it, literally. And you'll see what I mean later on in the video. I'll do my fan, get it all tied up. And I thought up something new I'm going to try. I just measure right across, keep the marks pretty close. You know, it is ice dye, so it doesn't have to be super fancy. And I use this construction chalk line rather than wasting my fabric markers. I would go through a lot of markers the amount of th things that I fold. And this chalk comes right out just the same as fabric marker would in the wash. The only bummer is it starts getting thin on the string pretty quick and I'll have to reel it back in and reapply some chalk, which is no big deal, but it's pretty quick and easy. You just rotate it on that screw there. Yeah, it's just getting a little thin down here. So you tap it. You have to refill these, these chalk lines once in a while. I know most people laugh, don't use this, but when I first started, I was a construction worker and my wife asked me if I could figure out fan fold when she saw one online and uh, I said, oh, I can do that. And so I just got out my construction tools. It was before I ever dyed anything. And I figured out the fan fold and uh, it was, I was so successful with it and got such good feedback, I uh, decided to start dyeing regularly. And that was like, I don't know, six years ago. Nothing but fun. And these don't have to be perfect as far as right on the mark. Because, you know, I style, it'll travel. So there we go. That done. Go and grab my chair over here. And I got a little tool here if I need it. A pair of tweezers. It's nice to manipulate the, the folds. I probably won't. But I just start right in here and get these guys going. It's important to make sure you pinch both the front and back of the shirt. You know, there's a couple, only a couple plies here, so it's pretty easy if plies of fabric. You know, if we folded the shirt up more and did this, there'd be more plies. But the dye travels by contact, so you have to make sure that the front and back plies are touching. You don't want gaps in your fabric plies. Okay, and these pleats go together pretty quick. I just get them all kind of started here. 
you just try to go fast since it's video. You can all see what I'm doing. I just grab it right on here and I pinch it right on the line. Since it's slightly damp, I sprayed it with this just regular water. And I do not sodash soak. I apply sodash later on in the process, either by sprinkling powder, or you can even uh, do what's called the uh, pariah method. A lot of uh, a lot of liquid dyers do that. They'll take uh, sodash water and heat it, or do it cold, depending on what their process is, and they will. Uh, squirt it on with a uh, with a squirt bottle of some kind or pour it on sometimes it's boiling it just depends you know heat when batching the tie-dye it's all about heat and time and there's a little chart i think it's like 70 degrees is 24 hours if you're batching if you're batching at 80 degrees it's 12 hours and there's there's good little charts you can get somebody made it up comes in handy. If you live in a warm climate like I do, you get the wash out quicker. It's kind of nice. Some people even microwave their stuff. I never did that. I lived in the colder climate when I started and uh, I just batched longer. Gives you more time to go tie up something else while it's batching. It's one thing I've learned over time is that patience in tie dyeing is really important. You don't want to rush the batching process. Everyone's excited to see what their shirt's going to turn out, especially if you're doing a new fold, a new or a new uh, design. But uh, over time, I don't get too excited anymore. I make sure that the dye is saturated well before I ever wash it out. And see, as you go, you kind of you pull the shirt around. I mean, well, this is pretty beginner stuff, but this is just my method. Try to go pretty quick. I've done it so many times, just second nature to me now. And over here, you know, where it's you got you got the uh, stitching and the on the shirt. It's a little more important to make sure stuff doesn't get wrinkled. You don't want any wrinkles. You want everything to be nice and flat across the top. Since all these pleats should be about the same size, whatever's sitting on the board should, you know, the bottom of the pleat up to the top should make them all about the same height. So you have a nice flat surface to lay your dye if you're doing ice dye. If you're liquid dyeing, you know, you probably could vary a little, wouldn't hurt you too much, but then the pleats wouldn't be uniform. So we want all the pleats to look really perfectly separated when we're done, all the same distance apart. That's why we take the time to measure and make an arc. Some people can just do it by, by eye. I can't do that. I always want it to be right, so I take a few minutes and, and mark everything out, draw it out. So what I do here is, um, this is gonna be like a supernova fold. So I just take uh, some used sinew, you can use string, thread, whatever you got. And I'm just gonna do a slip knot around one end. Sorry I didn't get this prepared. Look a little sloppy here, but it's all fun. So uh, I just, it's all frayed, I've used a lot of times. It doesn't matter at all, it doesn't affect anything. I just do a little granny knot around there, make a little slip knot. And I pull it. And you know, you can uh, you can pull tight sinew on these and get some really cool designs. I know Scott Rad Dyes Walker is known for that. There's a guy named Brian Beard. Look him up. He has some amazing fan folds. One of my one of my early inspirations. Armadillo Dyes, I believe is his name. He's in Texas. Good guy. So uh, anyway, it looks like this is lined up pretty good. You wanna make everything nice straight, so make sure everything's nice and straight. So I go ahead and just wrap a couple times to get this center part going. And I'll come up here and get these guys all lined up. So it's important that you get these arc lines all in a row. Get everything nice and straight so that when you apply your dye, you know, it looks like a nice radius. 
You'll be thankful you did it in the end instead of freehanding it. Because then you can see some you can see some uh, flaws in the design if you just freehand it. I'm going to tell the effort to mark this out, so I'm, hey, we might as well make it right, huh? Decreases the margin of error. The more articulate we are and the more perfect we try to be, it's, you know, tie-dyeing is not a perfect art. There are guys that make it look perfect, a lot of the uh, liquid dyers, but for us ice dyers, right, we, we kind of like some of the the mistakes that uh, the, that the dye creates as it flows through the fabric, the little patterns. Okay, so that's cool. I have these little clamps here I use. And I'll put that on there to hold it. Just hold this guy up, flip it back down, try to get the same height. Like I say, this is just a standard fan fold, nothing fancy. You could do all kinds of stuff with this afterwards. You could tie all different increments tight. You could incline. You could do it flat. You could do it in a gutter to get the uh, muck lines on the bottom if you're doing an incline. You can do them on a rack. You could place your die closer together, farther apart. All kinds of things you can do to get different variations of the fan fold. It's a very pleasing, popular method of putting some color on a garment. But when you do it loose like this, you get more flow, right? So, because anytime you're tying tight, you get resistance. And resist is what, is what uh, creates patterns and shapes, obviously, within the, uh, the garment. And I'm not going to want much resistance on this one. We're going with a nice flowy, kind of like a starburst or sunburst. Now, Mr. Tie-Dye has some really nice videos on YouTube that show you all kinds of different designs. He likes to use the airplane fold. That's the old school one. And that's a good one. It's from Andalas and you can get all kinds of different supernova effect out of it or starburst, whatever you call it. Me, I like to uh, to do this fan style more than anything else when I'm going from the center. Because you get all those lines nice and perfect. A lot of mandalas are started this way too. You can also do the mandalas with the, uh, with the airplane fold. Just like in an airplane we used to make when we were kids, paper airplane. Yeah. That one, that one is a pretty universal fold. So see, I'm moving right along here, get all these guys nice and straight. Try to keep everything all nice and tall. You don't want any wrinkles down here. Run your finger down the bottom, make sure everything's the same level. Well, see, this is so thin over on this side that you wouldn't be able to lay dye on there really enough to get through the whole fabric. So what I do is, I mean, unless I'm going for a certain look, which this one is going to be kind of an experimental shirt. So what I do is I like to flip this guy around here. Keep everything straight once again. The blue line's right on top. And I'll fold these guys in. Try to keep the blue line on top. So that's the center of our rays. One of the fan lines. Yeah, see, so that'll give us a little more surface area to place some dye right there. It's kind of nice. Surface area, that's a, that's a big thing when you're placing powdered dye. You want a nice flat surface to place the dye on. You don't want the edges coming down. So like this edge is down, that's no good. Get that line back up top. Because we want the dye to sit on every pleat. That way it gets well saturated, evenly saturated. We don't have blank areas on the finished product. Okay, and then that straps around a few times. And I tuck it through, tuck it underneath, pull it, get that out of the way. So there you are. That's our fan. Oh, well, we gotta do something over here. This should be a little tighter. So let me uh, get another little piece of sinew here.
I got a whole stockpile of use in you. I use for stuff like this. Figure why waste, right? Might as well reuse, recycle. And that's going to be a theme through all my videos is reusing whatever we can. Recycle. All right. No, well, I thought that was a slip knot. It's not. Let's go over here and create a new one. There we go. Pull that guy a little bit snug. This guy's lined up. Keep him perfect. See now, by starting at an inch and a half this far away, and the screw was a ways away from the center here when I started. So all these pleats are nice and bigger. Every one of these lines will show up all the way to the to the edge of the shirt. It looks real clean. You know, if you make it too too thin, they're too close together. Sometimes the pleats get so crowded, you lose you lose the definition in your fan lines. There we go. We'll cut this guy off here. Wrap a couple times, pull it through, make a little granny knot or a little slip knot in there. Okay, and there it is. There's our fan. It's pretty nice. And if you have flaps that are hanging loose ones here, sometimes I'll take rubber bands, put them around. But okay, thanks. Welcome back, everybody. I'm here with this fan fold. I ended up putting some rubber bands on here to hold the pleats a little better together and some loose flaps. And I've got this contraption. You're probably wondering, what the heck is this? Well, I got some units right here. This is something I created for my wife years ago. She was doing shibori. And this is a little movable arm here, which gives some tension to the garment after uh, manipulating it. So I put a couple clamps on here and uh, let's let's see what happens. So we've got these pleats here. We're going to put the center of it in this one. And I said this was a fan fold with a twist. We're going to give it a little twist here. Something I uh, thought up while I was walking my dog this morning. Uh, why not try something new? I don't know if this has been done before. Anyone crazy enough to try this kind of stuff? Probably. I don't know that anything is fully original at this day and age. But that's pretty tight right there. Let's maybe get it. Ooh, no, it came out a little too much. Let's put it better back in the clamp and give it some more. There we go, a little better bite. Everything seems to be holding together. This is actually the first time I've tried this, so wouldn't be surprised if it fails, but that's okay. I always learn more from my failures than my successes. I think that's pretty common. So, let's give it a go here. I think that's pretty tight. I don't yank it apart again. Clamp this in this one. And I got this little screw here on this vise that I can pull it apart to keep the tension going so it doesn't sag in the middle. Yeah. Is it even working? Not too well. So yeah, I just pull it tight myself. This seemed to work when I was able to do a shorter divide or shorter garment and I had more play. There was that much play in this vise. On this one, not so much. We'll pull as tight as we can to the end here. There we go, that tightened up pretty good. Not too bad. All right, well, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, take it to my dye area in the garage and I'll uh, see you all there. Oh, welcome back everybody here I am uh, about to put the die on my twist as you notice I wrapped my contraption here I don't want to get it to get too damaged and I got to get my mask here I always wear a mask when I'm dying because the chemicals they don't do too good for your sinuses so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to start off with some lighter colors. Let's say we'll start off with uh, some marigold. We'll go to wasabi green, alpine blue, and then we're going to go to uh, deep purple, and then I'll have this watermelon, and then we'll, we'll rotate them. We'll do a 
few uh, few different rounds. See if we can get this stuff to sit on here. So, uh, you notice having an incline. This here is a table I got. Um, I don't know if it was from Target. Uh, it has a drain in the middle. You can see it's kind of messy because I do all my dye in here. There's a bucket down below which catches the muck. And so the uh, dye I'm using today, I'm mixing soda ash with it because I think it's going to be hard to sprinkle soda ash on top here. It's going to be difficult to get the dye, uh, the ice to sit also. Let's, uh, let's give it a whirl, see what we get. It's going to be fun. I mix it up pretty good. Try to keep the soda ash. It's a two to one soda ash to dye ratio. Hope you can hear me through the mask. Yeah, we're gonna waste quite a bit. And that's okay by me. It's all just a fun experiment. Keep these out of the way so I don't mix them. I always wipe off my spoon. I have these cool little, um, I guess they're chemist spoons. I got a little set of them and I always have a paper towel, wipe it off. So this is my wasabi green. Go with some Alpine Blue. These are all Dharma colors. I have so much Dharma dye that I just use it up. I know there's some other great companies. I own some custom colors also. And I have some Grateful Dyes colors. I have not gone to the Happy Cat. Those look amazing. I just have to use what I have, you know. Got so much. It's crazy. Look at that. It sits nicely right there. Uh, I think this is going to be fun. I'm excited. And we'll go with some deep purple now. Love deep purple. One of my favorite purples. You gotta be careful though, it's pretty strong. It'll dominate a bunch of other colors, so. We'll not use too much of this one. Get some to sit up there. Oh, that's nice. It's going to spin around. Oh, it's going to be really interesting. See what we get out of this. And finally, watermelon. Love the watermelon. The way it mixes with the grape and the deep purple. They blend really well. It's a really nice red color. He might catch a little bit. <laughs> of course not. Okay, we'll start again. We'll just just use all five of these colors. And just keep uh, going down the line. And like I say, the soda is already mixed in here. So we'll just end up putting ice on top of this. And this is like I say, a two to one ratio. There's a quite a bit of soda ash. I have these mixed up for quite a while since I was doing uh, hot water irrigation back in the day. Back to the sage green, yeah, that was marigold. Now was it sage green? No, I think it was wasabi. Marigold, wasabi. little gap between these colors too because they give them some room to flow and I don't even mind if it's not fully saturated we're looking for some really cool patterns mixed with the white some nice splits hopefully I tried to pick a couple colors that split like that wasabi splits real well don't know about the rest of these marigold probably does
The Alpine Blue, it's a nice bright blue. You know, the blues and the purples, they're pretty dominant, you know, along with blacks. So we keep a little space between them. Don't use too much. Otherwise, ooh, I forgot the deep purple. Look at me. I skipped one. I didn't put any on, luckily. That's quite a bit, isn't it? Let's get a little in here. There we go. Now we get the watermelon. I might even end up uh, flipping this thing 180 degrees and run and die again on the bottom. We'll see. I don't know though. Maybe I'll just keep it like this and uh, applies a little more dye if it doesn't uh, saturate to my liking. All just an experiment. I love experimenting. You know, shirts are pretty cheap. I buy them by the case. So, yeah, three bucks a piece or so. Shipping. Back to this marigold. Wasabi. Oh, look, I actually caught some. What do you know? Yep. And we're going to the Alpine Blue. Pretty close to the finish line here, folks. Make sure you wipe your spoon off every time, right? You don't want to mix the colors, you get them contaminated. Pat them down. The, the uh, ice is going to push them down anyway, we'll probably lose a little bit of dye when we do when we put the ice on, but to be expected. I know a lot of people are skeptics about uh, not soda ash soaking because that's the way they've been taught. But uh, it's really bad on your hands. Really bad. I mean, you get dermatitis from it. It's ugly. Also, you can uh, get an allergic reaction. And it can get so bad at times that uh, 
You'll never be able to die with soda ash again. Your dying career will be done. You get health issues. So it's really good to wear a mask so you don't get allergic to the dye. And it's really good to uh, not get soda ash on your hands. I know you can wear rubber gloves if you have soda ash soaked garments. But uh, I prefer not to do that. So bear with me a second. I don't want to uh, pause it again right now. I'm going to go ahead and... Uh, Put all this dye away, clean up a little bit, get some ice out here. Okay folks, uh, welcome back. Got my ice over here. I'm going to start placing it on here. We'll start down at the, uh, the lower end, see if we can get this stuff to rest on here. I get these flat bottom cubes. Works pretty good for something like this. If you keep them connected too, they kind of stabilize each other. Sometimes I don't want it if I'm trying to be real accurate, but not on this one. And total experimentation here. I'm, I'm a little concerned up here. Let's see if we can get one of these double ones up here. You know, knocking a lot of dye off. To be expected. But a narrow area. I can always add some more. It's no biggie. Look at that. Got to be real careful now. Wouldn't be surprised if I knocked that off. I've done it many times. See, not all of them come connected, so I try to use them where it seems like it works best. They really stabilize each other. And also on an incline like this, you can lean them against the one down low. You start at the bottom, you can lean the cubes. <laughs> and I use these little tweezers here. Pretty cool device. Gonna get a little sag here in the middle to see what happens. Get some light in there. Yeah, I thought that would happen. It's all fun. I'm sure I'll come out here and find half of them flopped on the ground. Let's try a triple up here because it'll have this one flat area below to help it stabilize. Yeah, see that works a lot better. Feel like a little kid trying new stuff like this. I love it. Right, this, this video may never see the light of day. This may be a total bust. <laughs> we'll find out. One thing I just found out was my Bluetooth won't work when i am got the video going. So the tune's turned off which sucks but oh well we're dying anyway right it's more important moving right along pretty interesting stuff here <laughs> yeah I changed my company to crazy dies plan on trying some crazy stuff it's a lot of fun Whoa, come on, bud. Yep, figured that would happen. Get another double here. <laughs> Failure is the mother of invention. All right, well, I'm going to try to squeeze one right there, see if I can do it without knocking everything down. Oh, look at that. Okay, folks. Thanks for uh, bearing with me and uh, watching this crazy experiment. I'll uh, tune back in. We'll, uh, we'll see what happens.